My name is Stefan Deschain, and I'm the host of The Nature's Living Show. And my name is Samantha Graham, and I'm the podcast's producer. This is the YouTube version of the podcast. We make it available here for those who prefer this format. But podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Deezer, Overcast, and many, many other places. Please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information. But for now, enjoy this YouTube version of our podcast. On this episode of The Naturist Living Show, The Nude Music. This episode of The Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener, to episode 116. My name is Stéphane Deschaines, and I'm your host for this podcast. And uh, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a stats update. Um, I just came back from the uh, from PodFest. Uh, well, just came back. It was in early March of uh, 2020, if you're listening to this as a catch-up kind of thing. And in the past, I had been very excited because we had had over... 100,000 downloads of some episodes. And it was not a, it was a true statement. Uh, I was looking at the download stats uh, from the servers, how many times there was a request for the MP3 file. And that, uh, unfortunately, is not actually super accurate. And so we now have IAB tracking. Um, IAB is Interactive Advertising Bureau stats. And there's a lot of uh, rules about how to do it, and we do it through a company called uh, Blueberry, uh, spelled uh, with two Bs uh, in the middle, and uh, they they attempt they they are following the IAB rules, which attempt to clean them up so they're more accurate and so that everybody is on the same page and you can compare apples to apples. So it removes things like bots or. Problem IPs that are known to be spamming. Uh, they're also repeating, uh, removing repeating downloads. Uh, so, for example, you might start to listen in your car on your eye, and then you might stop and go, I don't know, go somewhere in the store and then come back, and your phone may re-download it depending on the podcatcher. Or you might listen in multiple places, so if it's all from the same IP. So there's a lot of rules, and it's certainly not a perfect science. But it makes a big difference. Uh, it makes a big difference in terms of the actual number. So it's almost like 10% is what I've discovered. So when I have 50,000 downloads for an episode, uh, when you go to the IAB stats, it's more around the 5,000 mark. And that's still a great number, and I'm not unhappy. And uh, it's, it's a real number, so why would I want a big number that's fake anyway? But what's most interesting is where that ranks us because there's a, a company called Libsyn who's been around for forever, I think since 2000, since before we did this show, I think 2004 maybe. And it's the oldest host and it's the largest. Um, they host a Joe Rogan show, which right now is the ultimate biggest, most popular podcast out there. And um, Rob Walsh uh, from Libsyn at the PodFest presented some numbers. And he said the median number of downloads per episode is 137. So if we get more than that, we're doing better than half the podcast. And in fact, at around the 5,000 marks, it puts us in the uh, 5 to 3% uh, range, depending on, because uh, it might now be 5,000. It's after four weeks and somewhere, we usually hit 5,000, but it might take us six weeks. Um, 
and, and our shows keep being downloaded forever. Episode number one is still getting downloaded almost every month. So the number keeps growing, but the way they're measuring it is an active podcast. And it is one that's on Libsyn only, but Libsyn has the biggest share of the market because they can, can't measure the number of downloads uh, for people they don't host. And um, so, yeah, it's a fairly, it gives you a sense that 5,000 is still really impressive. So is 3,000. 3,000 puts you in the top 5% of all podcasts out there. So, And how many podcasts are there? Well, there are 900, well, there were, as that was on March 6th to 8th, there were at that point 911,133 podcasts listed by Apple. Now, Apple is the biggest directory. It's the original one. It's the one that everybody is in, and most other directories feed from it. But there's a few that are excluded from that number. If some place was listed only in Spotify, for example, we're in Spotify, but some people choose to only list in Spotify or Spotify has some exclusive content, those would not be listed in this number because this is what's in Apple. But it's that's 95 or 99% of podcasts. But out of those 911,000 or so, there are only 246,493, or again, they were on March 6, 2020. Um, that's defined as having at least 10 episodes and having published in the last 90 days. So a lot of people start podcasts, and it's very sad to me that in Naturism, a number of people have, other people have started podcasts. I, I, there should be more podcasts on this topic. It's such a, an incredible, fascinating topic. Uh, but people start, they do a few shows, and they lose their momentum, their energy. So there's a number of Naturist podcasts who fit in the listed but not active. Now, all of that um, adds up to uh, over 27 million episodes. Can you imagine that? 27 million episodes. So we don't know how long they all are. Uh, according to Lipson, the average is 67 minutes. But uh, let's assume 30 to be conservative. So if each is 30 minutes, that's 13 and a half million hours, which is 562,500 days, which would be 1,541 years if you listen seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So, sorry, you will never, ever, ever, ever be able to listen to every podcast episode that's out, that's out there. Um, it's impossible, obviously, because you're not going to live that long. And um, it's, uh, well, and you may not want to because some of the content out there is kind of crap, to be honest. But it still gives you an idea of how much stuff there is. And to be in the top 5%, well, that's awesome. That's really awesome. And by the way, that's all less than YouTube. You can't catch up to YouTube. YouTube right now gets 300 hours added every minute. Every minute, 300 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube. Just, I don't know how they store it all. I don't know how they can maintain that storage, which is, I assume is to a certain extent backed up even. So it's just crazy. Um, and in terms of aggregators of where people get things, I told you Apple is still by far the biggest. Google and Spotify have had much bigger percentage growth. They are definitely up and coming, but Apple is still by far the biggest, and their growth in absolute numbers is still growing faster. As percentage, not as fast, but they're so much bigger that they are still growing. So those are a few stats for those who are interested in. Sorry if you're not. <laughs> We have a couple of voicemails, uh, and I'm sorry. I, one of them is particularly old, and I apologize. Uh, Matt from Calgary Nude Recreation uh, called in in December, and I wanted to respond. And I, I just things were a little busy, and so I didn't have time to respond and write uh, and write down some notes about what I want to say. So, let's listen to uh, his voicemail. Hey, Stefan. Uh, this is Matt from Calgary. I'm an organizer with Calgary Nude Recreation. and wanted to call out something that we found really interesting in the Nude Photography podcast. So in that podcast, uh, Matthew Hammond, the photographer you were interviewing, said, I wouldn't refer to me and my family as naturists. And then he went on in the next sentence to say, we're just comfortable being nude. And any situation that doesn't require clothing, we choose to go nude. At uh, Calgary Nude Recreation right now, we're working on a guide to starting your own nude group. And in it, we actually spent a lot of time analyzing the risks of traditional nudist uh, viewpoints and worldviews. And I think this is a really great example of where if you're only marketing your group or your resort to nudists, 
you really eliminate so many people who may be totally open to social nudity and most of what you're about, but don't actually identify as nudists or naturists in their day-to-day life. So basically, one of the conclusions in the guide that we're working on is that nudist or naturist as labels tend to carry a great deal of weight um, and actually tend to act as an exclusionary qualifier rather than an inclusionary qualifier for people. So Matthew Hemme described the meaning of naturism to him as being committed and dedicated to being nude as a primary way of being in the world, which is a bar that he doesn't feel him and his family meet. He then goes on to describe activities and values which should 100% place him as a potential customer or guest of the new friendly spaces. So anyway, just wanted to make note of that as a nice real-life example of the risks of sort of the quote-unquote nudist or naturist label um, and how that can actually read to people outside of the immediate community of naturists and nudists. Uh, keep the great work, and thank you for everything that you do. So, you know, it's true. Um, there's a lot of people who say they don't like the labels, but I think the problem is that it's what the label means. Like he said, it it carries a great deal of weight to some people and not always the positive one. But labels are important. They're a shortcut. Um, they, you know, I've talked before about my naturist, uh, recreational naturist versus ethical naturist scale. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to read more about that. Because it's not you're in or you're out. And yes, I could see how that would be intimidating in you if you thought there was this really strict criteria to call yourself a nudist or naturist. But I know from experience that there's a ton of people listening to this show that have different definitions of what that means, and they all use the term. And they all call themselves that. And whether you use nudist or naturist depends on where you're from and how you interpret even the meaning of that. But I don't think that means we should give up on labels. When a label means something, people use it. And, you know, people tell me that young people don't like to have labels, but that's not true. I keep meeting young people who call themselves vegans and other things. So there are definitely labels can, if they mean the right thing, is something people can identify with. And it's a shortcut. It's a way that you explain that there's, there is something. Now, if what you're doing is just getting naked, that's fine. But we've talked about how just getting naked is not as meaningful. Just getting naked is just a thing. And that's fine. It's fun. No problem with that. But naturism is an ideology. It's a philosophy. And it's a movement. And you can start as a recreational naturist just for fun. But then you might learn and feel that there's more to this. That you change in a more, in a deeper, more meaningful way because you're naked. And that's where naturism comes in. That's where the philosophy and the ideology, and that's where you start to perhaps move more towards the ethical naturism um, ideology, philosophy, concept. So uh, it might be a good way to to introduce people. I'm not saying it's not to just talk about let's go and have fun and be naked. But we also have to remember that just being naked is used and abused for all kinds of objectification and hypersexualization as well. So it could also turn people away if they won't understand that it's there's something behind it and that it's actually about body acceptance. And that's that's the trick. You might come up with a different name, but if that's misused, then that, that different name is meaningless as well. We have a second voicemail and uh, from Jamie in Michigan. So let's listen to that. Hi, Stefan. This is Jamie. I'm calling from Michigan in the United States, and I enjoy your podcast and i just wondered um if you guys ever have like dances or anything like that uh, just out of curiosity uh, nothing more uh just wondered how that uh works at a nature's park uh if they had anything like that uh i will be listening to the podcast so jamie's more recent he uh sent he recorded that in february and uh the question is, do we have dances? Well, at Bear Oaks, uh, there are dances, and yes, we dance nude, although it is an interesting thing because there's a lot of older clubs where there's no nude dancing allowed because they were afraid, going back in the 20th century, that it would be misconstrued or that people might do inappropriate things because they're nude. Um, certainly, if you're grinding against each other, it might not be quite right, but there's really no reason you can't dance nude, and in fact, some very artistic dance in the past has been done nude by artists, by performers. Um, And really, if you can really get to the point of a true naturist environment, 
Um, it's irrational to not be nude if you believe in all that nature is a means. And so, of course, you would be nude dancing as well. But I understand the fear, and I understand, especially when you connect it with uh, mainstream societal values and how it could be a concern and why it doesn't always work that well. But I've seen it in lots of clubs where people dance nudes, and it's not a problem. And perhaps there's a little bit more distance, but maybe that's not such a bad thing in some cases. So this episode is called The Nude Music. And um, it came uh, out of uh, something I ran across. I was in SoundCloud. Uh, SoundCloud has a lot of artists putting up music and original music and independent music. And I found some naturist uh, music and I found a song in particular that I found interesting by a company, not a company, sorry, a group called Laissez Faire. And so I contacted them because uh, I was curious about what they were. And it turns out it's Dario Western from Australia. Uh, he's a musician and songwriter, and um, he, uh, he's he been on the show before, actually. If you go back some episodes, I'll put a link to that as well. And uh, so I called him, and we chatted about his band, Laissez Faire, to find out more about what that was about and uh, to understand what the challenges were and the advantages of being a naturist band. Okay, uh, my name is Dario Weston. I'm a um, nudist, naturist uh, based in uh, Brisbane in Australia. I'm also uh, a musician and I'm uh, yeah, forming a band that's uh, out to endorse the, um, the nudist approach to life, mainly to people in the Generation X, Y, Z and uh, millennial uh, audience base. So yes, I found uh, I found your band through uh, SoundCloud, uh, and it was it's called Laissez Faire. I didn't know it was you because, of course, you and I know each other, and yes. sent a note out. So, how long has Laissez Faire been in existence? Um, I've uh, had like various uh, lineups of the band since two thousand and one. I originally started it uh, uh, as uh, like a sort of a resistance to some of these uh, reality um, music. Uh, stars like uh, Bardo and uh, Scandalous, uh, who were more about uh, fashion and stuff than they were about uh, musical uh, integrity. So um, yeah, I uh, I think that um, that uh, clothing, you know, is is too uh, overrated, and a lot of band, a lot of young people these days they just go for the bands because of uh, what clothing brands that they that they support or endorse, or instead of uh, listening to what their music and what their message is. So uh, the band Laissez Faire has been around under that name since 2001, or is it... Uh, yeah, basically, it, yes. Yeah. And have you been performing in places? Yeah, we've uh, performed at a couple of uh, mini uh, festivals in Brisbane, as well as at um, Pacific Sun Friends in uh, Donnybrook, uh, about uh, an hour's drive out from Brisbane, and uh, also at some um, open mic nights. Uh, always in naturist places or sometimes in uh, textile world as well? Um, yeah, the textile uh, places, um, yes, uh, uh, probably more than the naturist places, yeah. Okay, so when it's an open mic, it might be in a pub or something like that. That's right, yeah. Now, do you perform dressed then? Yeah, I do perform, uh, I do perform dressed, yes. And do you present uh, yourself have, as a naturist band or do you present yourself as a band that plays naturist songs? Um, probably a mix of both. Um, there are some um, the, the, there are some uh, bands that uh, play at naturist places, but uh, they stay fully dressed, um, and uh, they they mainly play like uh, old uh, top forty covers uh, for for many of the uh, the older generations. And um, I'm doing something a bit different. I'm doing uh, original songs, uh, not just about naturism, but also uh, stuff like uh, feminism and uh, environmentalism and it hasn't been as successful as I've uh, hoped, uh, mainly because uh, people in the Brisbane music scene, uh, not all, all of them, but a lot of them are very, they're very narrow-minded and they're very conservative. And if you if you present anything that's that's different to the norm, they uh, they, they basically uh, try to burn you at the stake, as has happened to me. What do you mean? Tell me more. Um, naturism is is a very taboo thing in the, in the Queensland um, 
in the Queensland team, no, we don't even have any legal uh, nudist uh, beaches in the state. And um, there, there are people out there who uh, believe that if you're a naturist, then you automatically are a paedophile or you're um, a or, or you are sexual deviant, or or pornographer, or something like that. But Australia um, has a lot of naturism. There's nude beaches and everything else. Yeah, not in Queensland. Um, the Queensland government has never um, legalized any uh, nudist beaches. So th there's that much difference between one uh, area of Australia and another. Yeah, Queensland is largely considered the uh, Arkansas of Australia. Uh, to uh, non-Australians non and um, yeah, many uh, tourists are very disappointed in the state because there, there are no legal nude beaches here. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting and sad at the same time. Yeah, and um, th th there are many people who are just uh, very set in their ways and um, yeah, they, 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 don't, uh, they don't really like um, you know, social change too much. Hmm. That's, that's very much... Uh... So what does a naturist in Brisbane do then, because you're so limited? Um, there are a few uh, naturist uh, places in Brisbane, um, like uh, Balcaz, uh, which I've uh, previously performed at, and uh, Pacific Sun Friends. So w when you perform in a place where you are clothed, um, just out of curiosity, what does a naturist band wear when they're wearing clothes? <laughs> um, the... There, there aren't really any naturist uh, musicians in Brisbane apart from um, myself. Um, there, there have been some bands uh, that have uh, gone naked or semi-naked on stage. Uh, that there was um, one fellow called uh, uh, Rollo who uh, fronted a punk ska band called Blowhard who often went uh, naked on the stage um, uh, at, at gigs. And, uh, yeah, he unfortunately died in um, on Easter Sunday this year when he was uh, doing some sound engineering at the local gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, yeah, most, most of the time here, nudity team performance is uh, seen uh, as either, as either uh, comedic or creepy. Right. And uh, w when you do perform in nature's places, then I assume you're, yeah. you guys are all nude, right? Yeah, um, depending on the weather. But uh, I have uh, performed uh, nude at uh, Pacific Sun Friends before. Uh, by myself and uh, with a, a couple of uh, girl musos. Yeah. So who else is part of the band? Um, at the moment, I've got a drummer called uh, Kim, whom I've uh, known for quite a few years now. Um, and um, I'm, uh, I'm currently um, yeah, um, going uh, through um, sites like uh, Star Now and Gumtree, um, yeah, looking out for other musicians. And is that challenging because you want musicians who are willing to perform nude? Yeah. Um, in, in fact, um, yeah, Star Now were kicked me off the, uh, the site back in 2009 um, when they, they, they said that I was uh, asking for nudity from um, the uh, candidates for the band. And I, I tried to tell them that it's a naturist band. And yet uh, they, uh, they, they allow uh, nude models and uh, nude actors and actresses to um, advertise them there, but not nude musicians, which I think is a double standard. Yeah, absolutely. So, are you were you permanently off, or did they eventually agree? Yeah, they deleted my profile, but I'm still able to um, access uh, some of their talent directory. Oh, okay. So they never relented. They you just find a way around it. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, which which instruments do you play? Um, I play the guitar, but um, I've also uh, been trained in uh, playing uh, piano and trombone and violin, and I've been doing songwriting uh, since the late uh, 1980s. I've uh, written a lot of uh, naturist uh, orientated uh, songs uh, for the band. Yeah, yeah, the songs are neat. I've listened to a few of them, and uh, they're they, they're good. Um, yeah, thanks. Have you had any success with any of them? Are they selling? Or... Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, the song uh, "Naked" um, on my SoundCloud, uh, my SoundCloud page, um, I originally posted it to YouTube, and it had a hundred fourteen thousand uh, hits uh, oh. to it, and it even uh, overtook uh, the Brisbane band, uh, the Veronicas, uh, in the popularity stakes at one time. Uh, but um, yeah, somebody falsely reported the, the video to YouTube as pornography, and they um, they deleted it. Really, that's interesting. Yeah. What, yeah, so was there, uh, was there, there was a music video then? 
yeah, it just had um, some um, some photos that I had collected off the internet, and um, and some of them uh, contained photos of uh, women uh, like uh, swimming naked and uh, just uh, hanging around together at nudist clubs and all that kind of thing. There's nothing there's nothing pornographic about them, but. Um, yeah, YouTube uh, doesn't uh, do proper investigations. If they just get a complaint, they'll delete it uh, firsthand. So what has been the uh, the reaction to musicians when you're trying to find folks to be part of the band? Yeah, um, yeah, a, a lot of it has been very negative. Um, there have uh, been uh, people who've uh, sort of uh, seen me as a bit of a dirty old man, you know, where because... Um, I'm looking for female musicians uh, for this uh, project, and uh, there've been um, there've been others even in the uh, in the naturist uh, community who have uh, who have also um, yeah bagged me out um, over it. Really? Why? What did they say? Oh, it's pretty much the same thing. They say that I'm a that I'm a dirty old man, and um, and the only thing is uh, the, the only thing uh, that that I want is. Uh, is, is, is sexual faves and all that, but I'm not that kind of uh, fellow, and especially in, in this day and age of the Me Too movement, um, you know, uh, one has to just be very careful with um, you know, the way you conduct yourself um, around women. So do you think it's harder for you to put this band together because you are a man? Um, I think so, uh, but uh, there, is a, there, there, there is a band out there called uh, the Soap Girls um, who are... Um, who are a naturist uh, band, the, the two sisters who front it, uh, they're, they're both uh, nudists and uh, they're very uh, out there about it. They even perform virtually naked on stage and all that kind of thing. And um, they, uh, they're, their shows are like, uh, very empowering for their audiences and stuff like that. So I think, well, if they can do it, why not me? Yes, that's true. But the, as you said, the two front people are women, which makes it yeah. easier to attract perhaps even other women because... Guys are more likely to be the, uh, you know, I'm a guy too and sad, but we're more likely to be uh, the creepy ones. Uh, women are rarely the creepy ones, and that's really unfortunate because I'm not, and I'm sure you're not either, but the, the, it's almost like the starting point for us to prove that we're not. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to, um, to to be the front guy in the band. I'm, I, I really want to be, be just uh, one of these, what they call sleeper blokes, you know, who just uh, sort of stand in the background and play and all that kind of thing. Uh, the, the band is, is uh, mainly going to be female fronted. Right. Now, the band in the past has had women because some of the recordings have female voices in them as well. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they, they were just, uh, yeah, pick up uh, musicians that I found through magazines and stuff like that. And uh, then just got together for the, uh, for the recordings. And, um, yeah, we didn't do any, any, any gigs or anything like that. Okay, so they weren't nude ever? No. What were their thoughts, though, when you were in terms of the topics and the songs they were singing? The, the lady who was singing, singing on, the, um, on the songs uh, Naked and Born This Way, yeah, she has uh, since uh, become a nudist after uh, attending one of these alternative uh, uh, music and arts uh, festivals. Uh, the one who was playing drums is sort of a bit on the fence, but uh, yeah, she's uh, she's a lesbian, so uh, she's quite uh, open-minded to different uh, subcultures and uh, how they operate. But they haven't wanted to join you into the band again. No, uh, the, the 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 lead singer is now living in uh, New Zealand. Oh yes, that's challenging. Yeah, and uh, the drummers are willing to uh, to just be a, a behind-the-scenes uh, person you know, with if I uh, want to collaborate further with her. Yeah. So if things go well, what do you, how do you imagine this? Do you imagine performing nude in non naturist venues? Yeah, I'd like to uh, to do like um, yeah nude uh, performances in um, in places like uh, pubs and uh, clubs, as well as uh, some of the um, some of the naturist uh, places. And eventually, I'd like to um, to go on to uh, some of the music festivals, which uh, have a more um, yeah liberal uh, attitude to nudity than some of the uh, some of the pubs and clubs out there. Yeah, like a lot of the a lot of the pe uh, people there go uh, go topless or nude at uh, some of these uh, music festivals. But that so that would be tough though. Uh, be performing where where everybody else is dressed, wouldn't it be hard to get away from the fact in a way that you were your nudity becomes the, the the show to a certain extent instead of being just part of the experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's a bit of a tough one. I mean, there are some um, 
there are some nudist musicians like uh, Tom Dow, who has uh, played to uh, non-nudist um, audiences with his uh, Bare Body Freedom shows in um, Times Square and all that kind of thing. And um, that hasn't really, um, uh, I don't think that, that that's really uh, deterred him or anything like that. But um, he's only uh, had like a few uh, few hits to his uh, videos on YouTube and uh, Vimeo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tom Dow has been on the show before, and yeah, he's very strong and and brave, and he seems to be uh, able to get people to, you know, even be nude in Times Square, as I'm sure you know, which uh, yeah. New York City, which would be that would be a tough one to do because people you'd get all kinds of comments, and you'd have to be pretty strong and not afraid of uh, the criticism or, well, frankly, the objectification and sexuality sexualization that comes with being nude in a textile environment, right? That's tough. Yeah, but the, the thing is that uh, it's virtually impossible to uh, break uh, the, the link between sex, uh, sexuality uh, from uh, rock and roll and uh, pop music. They've always been, they've always uh, coexisted together ever since, you know, where Elvis Presley and uh, Madonna and the Beatles and all that kind of thing. But um, there, there is a sort of, um, there is a sort of like, a, you know, a whole blurred lines, um, yeah, thing uh, to it. Um, yeah, the, the, there are uh, musicians like uh, Amanda Palmer who has uh, performed uh, nude on stage and in videos and all that kind of thing. And um, yeah, it's uh, uh, her uh, performances are not uh, sexualized at all. She's uh, sort of uh, using her nudity as a as a form of uh, vulnerability. So. When you're looking at uh, the sexuality, I mean, sexuality is certainly, uh, it's part of being human, so there's nothing wrong with that. The, the idea is to, the conflict, I guess, is how do you have a message about body acceptance and, well, your audience is looking at you with the sexual aspect of the nudity. Is there a way to change that or do you just have to deal with it? It's uh, something I've uh, I've got to deal with. Uh, there is a there is a very damned if you do, damned if you don't um, approach to the uh, human body. Um, like uh, there are um, there, there there are some uh, you know performers who are stick thin and um, they get trolls saying you know well, go and eat a burger you know get some meat on your bodies and then there are others uh, who um, who are a, a, a little bit curvy and they say go on a diet and all that kind of thing and um, yeah you can't sort of win either way and uh, the best thing to do is uh, just just ignore them. Well, uh, yes, uh, but sometimes there's so many of them, or at least it seems like there is. Uh, I'm wondering if there's things you can do though to break that uh, cycle. Like, does not not every performer is has to be uh, look like a model? Some could be older, some could be heavier. Uh, and uh, although you don't necessarily want to pick musicians because what they look like, um, I assume no. you, you wouldn't be doing that anyway, right? No, definitely not. Um, yeah, there are some uh, musicians out there who are not uh, oil paintings or anything like that, and they're, they're doing really well uh, for themselves. And uh, the whole body positivity thing that uh, came out a few years ago has now been um, embraced even by uh, Australian uh, musicians as well. So, yeah, yeah, things are slowly starting to change. The challenge, I think, as that I've experienced as a naturist is to convince them that nudity is about body positivity because I think in the textile world, it's almost the opposite way, right? Uh, when you're nude, you are uh, showing off and therefore it's about being looked at and having a good body. Uh, some people say, why do you have to be nude to accept your body? And what would you say to them? Um, I would say that... Um that it is, it's uh, putting yourself on the line so people, uh, it's a difficult one. I think, you know, when people go out to, um, to like, you know, a nudist uh, festival or, or nudist camp or beach, I mean, once they've seen what they want to see, there's really nothing left there for them to see. You've got to get to then know the person inside. Yes, exactly. That's true. Um, yeah. And it, what, is, that, that's, is that what your songs talk about? Um, yeah, not just about that, but um, but also uh, some of the nudist politics uh, that are that are going around, uh, like uh, uh, nudist uh, clubs and uh, beaches getting shut down, and um, and also um, I've written one which is not currently on the net called uh, "Why Won't She Get It?" about um, 
uh, having a, having a wife uh, that uh, doesn't accept uh, news. I mean, you try joining clubs and they won't let you in unless you have a partner. Hmm. And so, and tell us, uh, tell me about the other uh, songs with a naturist uh, theme that you've written. Um, I've written one called uh, Pain of Fools, which is more about body acceptance. Um, I used to um, work as a talent scout for a uh, glamour and nude models uh, agency uh, back in the 1990s. And um, some of these girls, uh, you know, thought that if they would get like a uh, boob jobs or nose jobs or whatever, they would get more work. And I said to them, you know, just learn to be happy with, uh, with what you've got because you could really screw your career up if you uh, change yourself. And um, some of them wouldn't listen and they, they ended up um, yeah, losing out on a lot of work because the uh, customers didn't like uh, fake looking girls. Huh. And, and what? And um, I've also uh, written a few uh, parody uh, nudist uh, songs as well, um, like uh, a parody of uh, Taylor Swift's uh, "Shake It Off" to "Take It Off," um, Twenty One Pilots' uh, "Heathens" to "Nudist," and uh, John Lennon's uh, "Yeah, Bring On the Lucy, Free the Free the People." Yeah. So uh, yeah, I've been uh, sort of turning a bit into the Weird Al Yankovic of uh, naturism of late. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. yeah. I performed um, some of these uh, nudist uh, parody songs at a uh, comedy night um, uh, early one in the year called uh, Wham Bam Cabaret Slam, and uh, the audience uh, really liked it. Uh, who are, the Soap Girls is that what they're called? What were you called talking about? The the Soap Girls, yeah. They they are two um, yeah French uh, sisters who grew up in South Africa, and uh, they're making an absolute killing on the uh, European and. Uh, UK uh, rock market at the moment. Oh, like very popular. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. They and that they're, they're very. Um, they have very close communication with their fans on uh, social media as well, and oh. they're, they're very supportive of, of their fans, yeah, which is uh, which is a good thing. Uh, you said they are French. Yeah, they're originally from France, and they moved uh, to South Africa when they were when they were very young. And they, they were signed with uh, Universal um, Music for an album that uh, topped the South African charts, but they quit the label uh, shortly after because, um, yeah, they they didn't sort of didn't really identify with the music that they were doing. Okay. They were they were promoted as like this sort of a pretty girl pop band, um, and uh, they they wanted to be more of the uh, right girl uh, punk rockers. Yeah. Okay, and are they usually topless? You said, or um, the, the bass player um, Millie Debray, uh, she goes uh, topless on stage, and her sister Naomi is uh, starting to uh, go topless a lot more on stage. Yeah, yeah. and they, they rarely have any bad behaviour at their concerts, and uh, anyone who tries to get the upper hand with them, the, the, the band quickly puts them in their place and uh, orders them out. Interesting. Yeah, I'll give them a try. Thank you, Dario. So, as you heard, it's quite a challenge forming a band with people. Uh, who are willing to perform nude uh, because you will, of course, invariably get objectified and hypersexualized. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because you're trying to fight that and you're trying to show an alternate way. And so uh, I was intrigued by uh, Dario's reference to the soap girls uh, because as a woman, that's even more intimidating and more difficult. But they perform nude. That wasn't their necessarily their original intention, uh, but they are very much about body acceptance and about liberating yourself. And uh, so there you help me get in touch with the Soap Girls, and I interviewed them. So, But before we do that, uh, let's listen to Laissez Faire's song.
as well. If you feel like it, fuck yeah. All right. I've seen men with bigger boobs than me, so if anyone takes offense, fucking go outside, man. So that was the Soap Girls in one of their performances. Not just taking their clothes off, but encouraging the audience to do so as well. So let's listen to them to find out why they do that and what it means. Well, it's Millie with the deep voice, the one who plays the bass. And my sister, I'm me, and I'm the guitarist, and we both sing, and we're in a band called the Soap Girls. Yeah, all the way from South Africa, we tour around the world. Very unusual, very quirky, but we love what we do, and I think we connect with other people who feel like society's rejects everywhere else, and it's why we love what we do. Because we started street performing from a very young age. Yeah. Yeah, and we just, I don't know, we, we love going out and doing things that make people think. That's cool. And and how would you describe your music? It's eclectic. Uh, we call it revolt rock because you're either going to be revolted by it or you're going to rock out to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's very different. We have very um, different like my sister influences Millie, to each other. She likes really like she likes more like hard music, and I like more maybe uh, melodic, softer music. So it's like a blend of those two yeah. worlds. There's grunge. There's um, tinges of metal. We've got punk, pop. Everything in it. Not too much pop. Uh, pop has good melodies, though. Yeah, Just but saying. still, like, live, we enjoy, like, very energetic music. And music that, I don't know, I find aggression in music sometimes is good, even if it's um, not necessarily hateful. Just it's got, like, a lot of emotion to it. I like it. Yeah, well, your music has a lot of power in it. It's a lot of, uh, it's it's very strong. Um, it's, it's widely described as punk. Do you, do, do you agree or disagree with that one? I think our ethos, we have punk ethos, definitely. Like, I wouldn't say all our music is just punk because we, we don't ever pigeonhole ourselves because when we play, say, like a punk festival, then people are like, oh, it, it's kind of punk, but it's not really. Or if we play a rock festival, they're like, it's not really rock, but it kind of is. So we never really fit in in any aspects of our lives. So we just do our own thing. Yeah, I think the way that we approach everything, like with DIY, we make our own clothes. That's punk. We yeah. do our own videos. Um, we produce our own albums. That is definitely and punk. And also our message, like just stand up for your freedom. Yeah, and don't take shit. <laughs> well, that's an awesome message. How did you get there? How did you end up where you are now? Ooh, it's a long story. Well, like my sister said earlier, we started out street performing um, when we were kids because you can't live in a country like South Africa, which is first and third world, if that makes sense. So you have a lot of tourism and a lot of great buildings and things. But at the same time, you have public hospitals that are completely neglected by a government that is so corrupt that they don't put the right amount of money into what they should, like the infrastructure. And we and our mom's always like, brought us up from a young age to see not just what we have, but she's shown us what other people don't have and how other people live. And we're very grateful that she did that because it taught us empathy and compassion from a very young age. So you can't grow up in a place like this and ignore the fact that there are homeless people starving. You can't ignore the fact that um, there are hospitals where all the equipment's breaking down and people are dying unnecessarily. So we wanted to be like Girl Scouts and we, were, we had our own vision of what we wanted to do. And our mom at the time, she had a soap company and we said to her, can we please take some of your soaps and go door to door and sell them for, to, to help this hospital? And she was like, okay, I don't really like that idea because it's not that safe but I'll follow you in the car when you're doing it so that we you like, don't get kidnapped or something. Yeah, but we were like, oh, that's cramping our style. So we had a little tiny harbor down the road from where we stayed, in this little village, and we would get onto the tourist buses and we would sing in different languages. And we'd meet people from all walks of life, all cultures. like. And yeah. we got a lot of shit for doing it because South Africa is very oh, yeah. classist. And if you're white and you're doing anything out of the ordinary like that, it's very shocking to the people here. So we were outcasts. So even at school, we got bullied and teased from teachers, kids. Yeah, we were constantly harassed. And it taught us to have a very thick skin. 
um, we were always entertaining people. And by the time we were 14 and 15, after getting approached by someone to go into the studio, when we were 12 and 13, we, we worked for years. Um, we actually got on to a Japanese compilation disc and it caught the attention of an a and guy from Universal awesome. Records. Yeah. So we got signed at 14 and 15. We thought that was the biggest thing ever. And we were very excited, but we didn't realize that it was an absolute loss of creative control and freedom. And for four years, even though our music was very successful here, we got charted on the radio. We were playing really big shows. But we were stuck in this contract where... It, everything looked great from the outside, but actually on behind the scenes we were starving and we had no say in, in our music and how we dressed and basically anything. If they wanted to put us in um, like a highly sexualized men's magazine and we were underage, we had no... Um, like they would just put pictures of us in there. Yeah, we had hmm. no um, say in it and it really pissed us off. And eventually we got out of that contract. We actually made it to America. We waitressed and we did whatever, we sold whatever we could and we got to America and we recorded a whole bunch of new songs. We'd started over from scratch and they did exactly what the record label tried to do. They just, but they wanted to give us this big money contract and we, we looked at our mom and we said, we don't actually want to do this. Yeah, we can just see where it's going again. Even though we were walking away because, I mean, we had nothing. Yeah. So we were like, nah, fuck this. And then we left. And then we, again, we just started uploading videos to YouTube. And a guy approached us in, I think, 2014. He sent us a message and, and he said, I love your music. You should come to the UK. And we were like, well, we don't have any contacts for shows. And then he brought us over, which was really cool, in 2015. And we started getting a really strong following. Um, First it was hard though. We did yeah. like shithole shows, like like Jesus <laughs> shows from hell, like honestly fucking crazy ones, and we and took a lot of shit. Yeah, we yeah. haven't stopped though. We've been touring relentlessly. This past year we've done eight months on the road, and last year as well about seven months, and the year before as well. So, but every year like we just get I don't know stronger and stronger. So it's cool. And more and more people that go to the show they always leave telling us they feel completely liberated and we fucking love that and because i mean obviously doing what we do and it's unfortunate but dressing how we do it shouldn't be that way but it, that's just how it is then you you have to you get questioned a lot and you have to justify yourself a lot and i think a lot of people that come to our shows they they're also different and and they see hey you know what these two are going up on stage and even though they're getting shit all the time they still carry on so for us, uh, having other people telling us that we inspire them, that just pushes us even more. Like we'll have um, people that are in the 80s, like this one woman, she's absolutely amazing. She gets on stage and she, she just says she forgets who she is, but not because she she's not happy, it's just society has made her feel that she has to act a certain way because of and her age. And then she's forgotten. So she's just happy and free and then you'll get um, women who bring their daughters that are 11 and people might say, oh my God, how can you have this? But they say they want their daughters to see that you can be whoever you want to be and it's on your terms. It doesn't matter what you dress, what you wear, what you do or who you are, you have every right to be yourself and it's your control, your freedom. And then you'll have um, people that have been bullied at school and like maybe they're eight, severely overweight, 18 year, like an 18 year old boy. And, and the mom will be, they'll say to us, you don't, I don't think you understand what you've done. Like for my son, he, he just, he just stayed in his room for a year because he was traumatized from being bullied. And he came to one of our shows and he was like, oh my God, I love this. Then you'll get people that are gay, but they're so scared because their family maybe is very conservative and they don't feel that they have like a space. I mean, look, they can go to a big stadium show and watch a show that's gay friendly, but maybe they don't have the money for that. But our show is more accessible to them in a way. And it's all embracing. It's not just a gay event. It's not just a straight event. It's not just for people that look or behave a certain way. It's for everyone. That's the beauty that of music. That wants to be themselves. That's the beauty of music, though. There's no, there's no um, gender. There's no uh, race to it. Like it's just music. That's it. You either love it or you don't. Well, that's that's an awesome message, and you know that's the way the world should be. But but the world isn't like that and so in a way what you're doing is uh, often 
uh, especially you, Millie, you're known for being top free on uh, on the stage and telling people to, you know, if you can't deal with it, get out, uh, yeah. which is awesome, except you know that some people are there because you do that. And so while you're trying to be about body acceptance, you're being objectified at the same time. Doesn't that bother you? Okay, well, the only thing I can say to that is this. You get people with foot fetishes, you get people obsessed with grannies, breasts, and things like that. While you say that people are going to objectify you, it doesn't matter what I wear. If I was out there in a wonder bra or padded bra, I would have people like looking at my cleavage. I would have people looking at me if I was in a nun's habit, because some people get turned on by that. If I take my shoes off, I have weird comments about my toes. I've seen the most vile stuff, sexual shit said about a granny. I don't know. I, for me, the thing is this. I love my own skin. I am so comfortable in who I am that I actually don't care what anyone thinks about me. When I have my period, I bleed freely on stage because I love the fact that it's not shameful. I fucking love it. I drink my own blood. And if that, <laughs> if that scares people, get out, man. I don't care what people think and I don't care to be... Um, viewed in a certain light by people and i think also a lot of people maybe if they do come to a show just to see boobs then they like five minutes in they realize uh oh then we're not there for their entertainment <laughs> like they're look, there for our entertainment well the thing is this after five minutes if you, you can't get over the side of boobs i mean look i'm a naturist nudist whatever you want to call me and i'm so used to seeing other people code that even for myself if i see like someone else topless for maybe a couple of seconds i'm like whoa and i'm aware of it but after a couple of seconds for forget, me i forget for other people it might take longer maybe five minutes but come on if you can't get into the music those are not our fans our fans are great people they we talk to all of them after the show there's no problem for me if someone finds us attractive. Like, I find Blondie fucking attractive. Even back in her heyday, my God, mm -hmm. like, the music is fucking great. Her image as well. Like, I love Blonde Woman. I think they're so cool. But at the same time, I respect the fact that she's a fucking great artist. And if all I could see her as is some freaking... Um, great looking human that's... then she would have listened to a, a model or yeah but then that just shows my own inadequacies and i haven't got time for people like that if someone can't get over the fact that i'm topless and anyway no offense but our breasts are very humble so it's not really gonna hold anyone's interest i'm just there to fucking do my th i love music the show is sweaty crazy if people ever wolf whistles at me i'll just spit i'm not there for anyone's fucking gratification. I'll tell you the biggest um, contrast that ever was. Um, before our show, we were once um, invited to be part of a burlesque event. And the way that the, um, the show was, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, look, respect to anyone doing whatever job. But that is, for me, a different thing to going on stage topless. And that's not your focal point. We're not there shaking our tits in anyone's face, making it a tease. We're there. That's it get over it. With burlesque, I noticed the people um, like that, our fans that were there, they felt quite uncomfortable because they were like, uh, we don't really like know where to look. I myself was like, it's kind of weird for me to watch this because I, I, I just see nudity as completely fucking normal. Like it's not to us, it's not sexual. So it, it was just bizarre for me. But hey, respect to those people doing it. And it just showed me the difference. There's nothing inherently sexual about skin. And if other people want to make it, then what, are they getting turned on by a woman breastfeeding a child? That's fucked up. And I'm sorry, but I don't deal with those kind of people. Well, it, yeah, totally. I mean, it, be, you're just being, being the, yeah. your natural self the way you were made. And, and the, you know, breasts first and foremost exists for feeding children, which is weird because yeah. people worry about children seeing breasts. But it, that's pretty fucked up. <laughs> the <inside>. irony. <laughs> Do you know one... Breast Breast should be like put on a pedestal. Man. No, do you know They're one amazing. other one other point I have to make? Um, it's pretty amazing how desensitized the world is to violence. And I think the reason is a monetary reason. If we realized how shocking war is and the loss of lives, like animal lives that are innocent, children and women and men that have absolutely nothing to do with the government fighting shit for oil or whatever the reason is, we would be 
so upset. We would never allow this shit to happen. So you have violence in media, you have violence in games. People would rather film um, people fighting than break it up. And, and then they get angry when they see people kissing or holding hands. It's very weird. And I just think it's shocking that people don't mind naked women as long as it's in a sexual like or way. Or they've paid for it. So like if they go to a strip club and then they've paid to see this, then it's fine because in their head, they're in control. But to see a woman that wants absolutely nothing from them, but that, that is top It freaks them out. It makes some men actually get angry. Yeah, they get pissed off. But <laughs> it's because they know they're not going to get anything, that there's nothing And that the person doesn't do. want anything from them. Exactly. And I think for me, big sign that I, I completely understand that our what we're doing is non-sexual is that I don't feel uncomfortable if there's a child at our show. If I felt that our show was in any way sexual, I would immediately feel uncomfortable and, and ask them to leave. But even like, you know, with the question about people objectifying people, I think I've read comments of artists that, um, and it's always with, I mean, you're gonna get it in sports if there's females involved. Like whenever there's a female involved, you're gonna get some idiot saying some stupid comment. And I think it's a it's a problem of um, either culture or society. Really, it's not it's not something that should be on the person that's being uh, objectified by yeah, people because that's not their problem. Exactly, it's like a tennis star that has weird people trying to check up their skirt. Okay, what is she supposed to wear jeans when she plays? Fuck sakes. It's like it's mad. It's it's the same as people like fetish fetish. Oh, how do you say like fantasizing or fetishizing? I don't know how you say the word. Yeah, that's right. Is is the granny meant to wear like this giant parka and like chains around her neck? But they still, off? but they still like that. Because yeah, it's, it's in their head. It's, it's just it's a it's weird mentality. how they've been brought up, and they think that a woman is just an object to them. So. But for me, the best thing to do is this: if people are easily shocked, they deserve to be shocked more often. And I think if people saw boobs or skin like as a like something natural and they were more exposed to it they would maybe stop making it a taboo stop exploiting it for financial gain if that makes sense we wouldn't need these stupid magazines where people have to sell a woman's freaking body in it and, and i think people, people would be more happy of course yeah because yeah. you wouldn't have to like even somebody told me i think this is a, is a great like uh what's the word I don't know. I don't know. My English is not great with these, <laughs> with these big words. Okay. No, but like this guy, he said he went to a, it was a naturist um, resort. resort, and he said he, uh, he was talking to this guy that I think he was a doctor or something, and the other guy was a I think a street sweeper or something, and he said the most beautiful thing about that was nobody knew anyone's rank or status or how much money anyone had because everyone was the same everyone was equal yeah absolutely well it, it, so i totally agree with everything you say and that's the right thing to do but in canada for example uh for over two decades women have had the right to be top free as it should be like no you shouldn't be told that you have to wear this especially if men don't have to but you almost never see it you don't see it on beaches very rarely because it's well, hard okay. It, yeah, the, yeah. The, you get shamed or you just feel you're being looked at and to be the first is hard and you're performing. So how how did you get to the point that you were so OK with it and that you just don't give a shit? I think personally for me, I always saw that no matter what you do, you will be judged by people. You're going to be hated or you're going to be loved. So you might as well enjoy yourself doing it. Yeah. And for me, like, I feel so comfortable in my skin. I honestly don't care. I've always felt that way. I grew up running around naked as a child. I, I've not, I don't care what people think about me. If they have a problem, then that's on them. And I look them straight in the eye and I'm like, the fuck are you looking at? If someone can't accept you for your skin, then that's an intolerance that will end up leading to racism, sexism, a lot of negative things. And I don't think it's a good thing that people should be allowed that. Why should someone impose their beliefs onto another human being? I mean, it's not like boobs are um, like an unseen alien thing. Everyone has boobs, even men. So people should just back off and accept that they have no control over someone else's freedom. So like, like I have really small boobs, I don't really care. 
And I love when I see um, other girls that are maybe they're like, oh, I don't have big boobs or because I think especially young girls, they think that they need to have this. Um, I'm very skinny. OK, so I'm, I'm not going to I can eat as as many burgers or whatever as I want. I'm, I'm not going to be like this curvaceous, uh, I don't know, cartoon like woman. And I think, especially nowadays, most young girls, they're being inundated with images of women with like these big bums and tiny little waists and then big boobs. And that's the definition or ideal woman. And that's what's been like forced down their throats. And they're thinking, oh my God, I need to get all the surgery done because people aren't gonna find me attractive or um, I, I don't like myself. And I think it's good for them to see somebody that's not the ideal like, I'm not, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do know, but it's, it's, it's the whole idea, concept of an ideal is wrong because there is no ideal. I, I've, I have literally seen thousands, probably tens of thousands of breasts and women and bodies. Um, and they're, they're all different. Every single one of them. It's like a face. And in fact, I can recognize people sometimes from a distance when everybody's known more by their bodies because you start to get to know people's shapes. So it's insane to think there's an even an ideal. But one of the things that drives me nuts actually is when people say, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with with my body with all its imperfections. Wait, hold on a second. Why is it even an imperfection? Why are you even saying that? Because it's just... Exactly. It's who you are. It's what you are. It's not imperfection. It's what you are. But that society, they instill an insecurity in people so that they can exploit it for monetary gain. But like so even you... if people feel that their breasts are small, they're going to go out and get surgery. If people feel they have stretch marks, they go get that lasered off. If they feel that they need muscle, they go and buy all this crap. And it's so dumb and unnecessary, but that's the way the world works. What were you going to say, dude? Oh, yeah, I was going to say that... Um... You know what you're saying about that, that there is no ideal? Yeah. That's what I, I wanted to show, especially young, even young boys, that it doesn't matter if you embrace that you're different to everyone else because people wanting to have the same boobs, the same face, the same lips, I don't know, it's, it's a messed up world and a messed up way of thinking because they're never ever going to be happy because at the end of the day, it's not them. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. My sister gets attacked by men for not having um, big boobs. I do too, to an extent. Well, I always get called a boy or I think so it's hilarious. Than that. Yeah. But it, it's crazy that people feel that they have this right. Um, if you're not wearing much clothing to insult you, that you're some sort of lesser human being. Well, it's because, you know, they're, they're trying to have power over you. They've learned that women in particular can be uh, made more insecure by criticizing their bodies. It's a, it's a power thing and it's nasty and it's horrible. Um, yeah. it, 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 nobody should have the right to criticize something you can't change because it's you. Um, you know, it's like if somebody, it's no different telling you, you have too small, too large breasts, too dupey breasts, whatever it is, is the same as telling me that they don't like the shape of my nose. It, it's just my nose. It doesn't matter. Or like they're saying they don't like the color of your skin. Well, exactly. they, yeah, even worse, but, exactly. Fuck's sakes. But it, it's crazy how people, it's like intolerance, they, they feel so justified. But I love that at our show, everyone gets celebrated. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter um, how old or young you are. You are and the reason is because the people that go to our show are the kind of people that don't like the way that other people around them think. Maybe their own family calls them weirdos or outcasts. And they want to, not that they want acceptance, they just want a place where they can be themselves. So you get people who will cross-dress at our show. You get people who um, don't, they, they're shy to be themselves around their family, but they love to take the top off at our show. And they, they just feel comfortable doing it. And but I even, love that. Even for me, like, especially when I was younger then, because I I was a really late developer, and um, even at school, then all these girls they had these boobs and these hips, and I was just like a bean pole, and I was like, oh fuck! And every night I was like, please God, please give me some boobs, please! And it never ever happened. <laughs> I was the opposite. But, I didn't want boobs or anything. I was just annoyed. And then, um, but I think for me, it, it's uh, it's obviously been like a process or whatever to to be comfortable enough to just like. If you look, if you take yourself out of the situation and you look and you're like, hey, you know what, I'm on stage and playing music, that's like the most 
um, purest form of, uh, I don't know, expressing yourself. So why not do it the way that you're, you're comfortable and why not push yourself? So for me, that was really um, an eye opener for me. And yeah, it changed the way I see myself too. So do you, are, is this part of your songs? Do you talk about this in your songs? Yeah, a Definitely. lot of them are about like being proud to be society's rejects. It's about standing your ground no matter how much shit you get. Yeah. But what about body and body image? Do you talk about that? It depends. We don't like blatant lyrics often, but you can get the gist of what we're saying. So the songs can be interpreted by people, but they usually get what we're saying without it having to be like spelled out for them. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing about art. Art is about interpretation and has to be open to interpretation so people can start talking, right? Yeah. Like even in our song, Hater, we wrote about people writing ugly things about us. Even Chains is about um, not being a slave to anyone else's opinion of you. I mean, people are so scared of being themselves for judgment. I don't care at all. I used to be very shy, almost cripplingly so, until we started street performing and I got out my shell. It took years. I was never shy of nudity, though. That for me, my body does not define me. I, I'm not defined by clothing. I'm not defined by shit like that. But I was shy of maybe um, if someone bullied me or said something, I, I wouldn't fight back now. Someone would be lucky if they walk away without a limp. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> I, I don't take shit from anyone. Like, I don't. And I, I, I want people to know that they don't have to take shit from anyone. You don't have to get violent. But I mean, for goodness sake, someone like shouts shit at you, just laugh. Or otherwise say, go fuck yourself. And just because maybe, you know, even that show, as I've said, doesn't matter what anyone here is wearing. No one has any right to touch anyone. And no one ever does. But funny enough, the only time I've ever been groped by a person at the show, it's by a woman. Twice. Really? Hmm. And you yeah. had you had a terrible incident in the UK where somebody threw fake blood on you, right? Yes, and that was just because of the way that we chose to express ourselves. That was on our first tour. We were shocked. We were, we had never toured out of South Africa at that point, and we were invited to a venue. And the owner of the venue decided to teach us a lesson, and he, he said we were damaging to the fem a man saying we were damaging to the feminist movement. No, so he called us. That yeah, pretty much sums it up. He called us sellout sluts and he said he was going to teach us a good lesson. So we were invited and very hostile, xenophobic environment. Um, three songs into the set, we had a door open next to us on the stage. The guy's girlfriend and best friend came out and threw like a shit ton of this fake blood that smelled like vinegar all over us and our gear. But we didn't know what it was at the time. I was just blind and I couldn't see anything. And it was horrendous. And the guy was so proud of it. He actually, we didn't mention the venue or anything, but people knew. And he and came out and he was like, it was me. I did it. I ordered the attack. And it was just like, wow, this man is not even sorry for what he did. He's actually justifying like an attack on a human being because it was right into our faces. I was lucky it didn't go into my eyes or anything, but my sister suffered. And our gear got destroyed. It's fucked just over an image. I mean, what's the difference between that and racism? There isn't really in a lot of ways. I mean, racism can get nastier and for other reasons. But what, what yeah. strikes me is how it's just rude. Like, he, you were his guest. He invited you to play in his oh, he, place. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. He didn't even have the balls to be at the show. Really? Nope. No, he, he away. Us. No, he didn't meet us. He didn't speak to us. He orchestrated this whole thing, and I don't know. It's crazy, but just because apparently we dared to call ourselves punk as well, and how dare punk stress the way we do. As <laughs> I, if... <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that because yeah, um, people are so judgmental. Punk actually... Yep. Yeah. So it didn't. It didn't slow you down. It didn't stop you, did it? Um, to be honest, well, right no. after that, we wanted to go home straight away. We were really distraught. Um, we were like shocked. We wrote our song Bad Bitch after that a couple of days after that incident. And it just actually, after wanting to leave and just being like shocked, it, we actually thought to ourselves, hang on. That's what they want. That's exactly what they want. So we just carried on. And even when they attacked us, we didn't stop immediately. We were just like shocked. But then the equipment, the equipment, like our microphones and everything, like 
broke down. Destroyed, yeah. She ran out when her eyes started burning to an extent she couldn't see. So I, I had to deal with the woman who chucked the shit at me, coming up to me, smacking my mic into my face. Wow. I mean, what? What the hell is wrong with people? And I wish that we'd been able to do more. Our manager tried to stop them, but she got punched in the stomach by some of the audience. It's horrible. It's and horrible. That's pretty, yeah, it's horrendous. Just shows you the mindset and mentality of those people there. Well, and good for you for not letting it get to you. I, uh, one of the issues we often have at, with our staff is after working uh, an entire summer, they're mostly summer students, and uh, working an entire summer, sometimes they get jaded because when you deal with nasty people, and we, you know, we don't, most people who come, we get thousands of people who come to Bear Oaks every year, uh, the Nature's Club that I own. And um, most people are great. The, the, the vast 99.9% .9 are great. But when you deal with a two, three, four, perverts or whatever it makes you that that sticks in your mind and it it makes you yeah. suspicious of everybody and if you let that happen then you start to distrust the world and that's not good yeah it is true i mean look you get it with people sometimes you trust people and they go on to stab you in the back but i guess going through those kinds of things just teaches you to appreciate the people that are genuine the people that are honest and the people that uh, like you they're not the same as you but they're on the same wavelength like an alien from the same planet like your fans that follow you yeah they're freaking cool it's like a family so, weird crazy Adam's family type thing but yeah so are you making a living at this is this are you good enough and popular enough now that uh, it's your business well, it kind of has to be. We don't. We didn't get to finish school. Um, we have nothing else, so we put our hearts and soul into this. And, and yeah, we, we're very grateful that people download our music. And our fans yeah. are honestly amazing. We have people download our music, um, buy albums, buy merchandise, and they really support us at the shows. So after years and years of like radical struggle, yeah, we are able to live off what we do. But in in the this. The new world, new to me to a certain extent, because I'm a bit older. The way you, it's much harder to make money with music, right? You have, you people don't necessarily have to buy albums. So, how do how do people who want to support your message and your music? How do they support you? Well, they can go onto our website, yeah, and download music or buy an album yeah. or a shirt. But also, even one of, just spread spread the word. Yeah, but one of the best ways also just go out and see bands. Go out and like. Support live show. music, yeah. Well, that's awesome. One other thing. Yeah. We just want to say that people should maybe, um, you know, if you've got body confidence issues, I think you should see yourself naked more often. And I think you should get comfortable with looking at yourself in a mirror every single day till you reach the point where you are so comfortable that you don't even see in your mind all the things that society tells you to think about yourself because when you look at yourself in a mirror initially you're not even seeing your own self you're seeing every label that's been imposed on you and i think people should also maybe focus outwards on maybe doing volunteer work or something else so that they realize that there's so much more in this world than people's down judgments i'd like to put some of your music in the podcast do you have the the right to give me permission to do to put a song in your podcast yeah of course yeah that's the beauty of diy <laughs> we, and also yeah. our, our music video for the like song chains has just been released so yeah sorry it cut out Check there out. which song uh was released for the music uh chains chains okay. we just released the video yeah so which song would you like me to put on oh okay oh my god that is such a freaking tough question I think chains in society's rejects. Is it gonna be strange? Well, you're ready.
So if you want to listen to uh, more music by Laissez Faire or get in contact with them or listen to music from the Soap Girls, um, I will have links in the show notes to uh, both of their websites and where you can get more music as well. So that's all for this episode of the Naturist Living Show. Thank you as always for listening. Again, my name is Stéphane Deschain, and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park. I make the show with a lot of help now from Samantha Graham, who is making the task so much easier by helping produce and doing some really, really excellent editing. As I said several times in the show, you can find uh, links to all of the items we talked about in the show note on our website, which is found at naturistlivingshow.com. And please keep sending your comments and suggestions. I appreciate getting them. enjoyed getting the voicemails. And you can see we respond to them when there's questions or there's interesting stuff. Um, the show's email address is contact at naturistlivingshow.com. And you can also call and leave a comment. Don't be intimidated. You take as many tries as you'd like. And you can even delete it when you're done if you don't like it. So can't promise we'll use it, but I will definitely listen to it. So the show's phone number is, you, you're, you call uh, country code 1-905-473-6060. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, you can call 1-888-373-9124, which is toll free. Or you can Skype just Bear Oaks, B-A-R-E-O-A-K-S, one word. And no matter which one you do, you end up in the voicemail system for Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park. And the Nature's Living Show's extension is 333. Very simple, 333. I hope you enjoyed this show and that you'll join us again for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca. you enjoyed this video as we said at the beginning podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app you can find us on apple podcast google podcast spotify iHeartRadio, tune in stitcher deezer overcast and many many other places please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information on how to subscribe <laughs>